You're listening to the Career Musician Podcast with creator and host, Nomad. With 20 plus years of experience in the music industry, Nomad has done just about everything to earn a living as a career musician. From being music director to celebrity artists, playing iconic arenas and stadiums, composing for film and TV, and even playing your average local club gigs, he's done it all. Nomad's mission is to empower musicians across the globe with strategies for a sustainable career while blasting stereotypes and to bring you tried and true wisdom from his colleagues in this crazy business we call music. On this episode of the Career Musician Podcast with yours truly, Nomad, we have Zito, production manager, front of house engineer to the stars. Literally, this man has worked with the likes of Ariana Grande, Steve Aoki, One Republic, Backstreet Boys, and that's just a few. But my focus today with Zito is so important to hone in on his ability to pivot. When the pandemic hit, he was on the road with Steve Aoki and got the message day two the tour is canceled well zito took that information and literally went home to the drawing board and turned his whole career around and has created a business that him and his wife brought from their home kitchen to the masses rock and rolls nashville provides some of the tastiest sourdough cinnamon rolls you have ever laid your taste buds upon check it out right here on the career musician podcast and that can be like honed and improved as like by practice and repetition. But then that's like this little portion. And then there's everything else, the branding, the marketing, the, uh, the hustle. Right. And it's sadly like 20% and 80%. You know what I mean? With that being said, welcome to the Career Musician Podcast, my friend, Zito. That was the perfect intro. I could, we couldn't have got it better if it was scripted. So <laughs> there you have it. Yes. We're hustling, man. I mean, we, we, we're busting our asses and it's, we've gotten a lot of press. We've done a lot of press, but everybody looks at it like we're lucky. And the, the reality is that we create our own luck. At, at the end of the day, everything is happening because we work for it. People are like, well, how did you get in Forbes? How did you get on Kelly Clarkson? How did you get on this? What are you doing? We're, we're busting our asses. We're harassing them until they say yes. We're emailing, we're calling, or putting ourselves in positions to run into them. And so none of it just comes to us. We're not sitting here in our phones, not ringing with all this shit, man. It's just like, I got to work for it. And so in the same way you work for it in the business. Man, you, you could say that a million times, times a million, and it wouldn't be heard enough, I believe. Yeah. That is the crux of the matter. Uh, oftentimes, I say that at the beginning of, of other episodes, you know, you have to create something. You have to make something out of nothing. Yeah. You create your circumstances. You put yourself in those circumstances. You, it, it, there, yeah, there's maybe one in a million that are, you know, musician or whatever it is, sitting there playing something on YouTube and they get discovered and they're the next big thing. But that's the exception. The rule is you, you create your situation. I mean, you're same thing for you. You're a hustler. You put yourself in the positions to, to, to win because obviously you have a gift. You have an incredible gift as a musician, as a band leader, as those things. And there's also a lot of guys that are have some of those same qualities, not your qualities because you're unique to you. So how do you take those skills and how do you move it forward? And like we said, that's the other 80% that you just, that you have to work on. You don't want it, you don't. You hustle or you don't. It's just not going to come to you. And the people that think it do will just sit there and bitch and complain all the time. They're not working. (laughs) Well said, my friend. Well said. So, okay, you're putting together ginormous world tours, yeah. the production manager, the front of house guy, you're doing all this stuff. All of a sudden COVID hits in the States, yeah. uh, you know, April, March, 2020. Uh, I can tell you exactly. We, yeah. we were on tour. I was out with uh, Steve Aoki. We were doing a, a run. I was my first foray into the, into the DJ world. And I thought, uh, you know, why not go with a guy that throws cake at people? That seems pretty cool. So, you know, we're out doing our shows and of course we heard about the pandemic like everybody else. And I'm talking to all my other buddies that are on tour. What's going on? Do you think we're going to cancel? Is there anything in it? And, and it was all a resounding. No, no, no. This is, it's in China. This is so far away. Right. We loaded out our truck in, uh, 
uh, Ohio and Cleveland, Ohio on the 12th of uh, March. 13th was a day off in Chicago. We're all hanging out. By the end of the day, we're on the bus headed home. Tour was canceled. And that was it. Didn't know the night before that was the last time we were ever going to load a truck. All our stuff was in there, personal stuff, whatever. So it was. It totally took us by storm. We're all headed home. And of course, at that point, we thought, oh, we're going to be back to work in May at the latest. And over the next few weeks, as things unfolded, we realized that wasn't you know going to be the situation. Having worked in live entertainment for my entire career, 21 years now, that's kind of all I've known. Um, any of my quote unquote pivots within the industry are still all based in the industry. I thought, you know, I've always thought if I didn't tour, you know, kind of like you, you know, well, if I'm not a touring musician, I could be a studio guy. If I'm not a studio guy, I could work with other artists as a musical director, whatever, right? But every pivot's still within music, essentially. Right. Well, all of a sudden, there's no music, there, there's no touring, there's no touring world, there's nothing for me to pivot. And I've said, I've looked at this, you know, last year I did Ariana Grande and I have a resume of a lot of large scale artists. And I said, I'm not qualified to work in the real world. I can't go get a job anywhere, but Target or Home Depot or Amazon here. So what am I going to do? How am I going to provide for myself and my family? Even though I'm highly skilled, I'm one of a, you know, very few hundred people in the world that can do my job, but how do you put it on paper? And so I was wrestling with that. And, uh, but what I did do, and, and I think this is really important, was important for me, I should say, the very beginning of the pandemic, I said, I'm going to choose to look at this as a gift. And I'm going to say, the gift is time because I've been gone 300 days a year for the last five or six years now. I never have time to do anything. So I told my wife, I want to account for this time as if it's someone gave me a million dollars. And I, if someone gave me a million bucks, I should be able to say, okay, 100 grand went to this, 500 grand went whatever. So here's the time. So I was focused on all sorts of things, on bettering myself, on, on biking. You know, I'm big into, into cycling and I wanted to hit my first century. They call it your first 100 mile run, ride. And so I was doing that stuff. I was baking, I was cooking, I was gardening and doing all these things. And so I didn't want to be lazy. I wanted to be hustling. And if even if I wasn't specifically working at that point, I wanted to be moving towards something, bettering something. So I've always been into baking, always been into cooking, gardening, all those things, fermenting, all the all that stuff that I just never have the time to do. So I was focusing on a lot of that. And I had started on sourdough, uh, like everybody else was doing, and all the savory things. I mean, there's only so many loaves of bread you can make, and I made them all. <laughs> and and uh I was trying to think of other fun things to do. So for Easter, uh, my wife and I made these uh, cinnamon rolls. And we thought, you know, these are pretty freaking spectacular. They're cool. And that was kind of all we thought of it. And my wife saw the baking kind of spark an interest in me. And so I started selling my bread in the neighborhood here in, in, in our subdivision, yeah. selling 10 loaves a week. And I thought, okay, cool. This isn't going to pay my mortgage, but it'll pay my groceries. And so that was how it started. I could pay my groceries with this. And... As I was selling the bread, I thought, I can't really scale this. Like, how do I make this into something bigger? I can't bake more out of my house. I don't know what to do. So I thought about those cinnamon rolls and I thought, okay, if I can only bake two loaves of bread in my oven and I'm charging 10 bucks a piece, what if I could bake, I could bake 64 cinnamon rolls and what if I charge five bucks a piece for them? And that was kind of how it started. So put them up in our subdivision and sold like 63 the first week. And I'm like, okay, cool. The neighbors are throwing us a bone, right? The next weekend was 83. And we're like, okay, well, let's see who orders next week. And then it was 200 and it was 400 and then it was 600 and it never stopped. And that was how it started. So <laughs> we just started, started selling, selling our rolls and eventually outgrew our home kitchen, uh, moved into a commercial space and, and have it look back. And really it, it feels like we slapped the ass of a horse and we're just trying to hold on as it barreling down the road you know, but that's kind of what we do. It relates, you know, to everything else. Like you just hold on and, and adapt as you move along. That's it. What an inspiring, motivating, uh, champion story. I mean, really, it's, you know, that is, it's storybook. Like it couldn't yeah. go any more perfect once again. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. And when you, you said something earlier that, you know, I'm qualified to do a job that, only, you know, several hundred people in the world can do at this level, right? Yeah. 
yep. and the credentials speak for themselves, the resume. And then you said, you know, well, now I'm coming home and I'm qualified to work at Amazon, Target, or Home Depot. Yep. And that is such a true but sad statement all at right. the same time. Right. However, you weren't going to settle for that. Yeah. yeah. And, and same here. Like, sure, I could have done the same thing. I could have went to Home Depot and all these other places and applied and just put my head down and do the quote unquote grunt work. And yeah. I'm not, we're not knocking yeah. grunt work. Yeah. You know? And there's something to be said about the grunt work. The grunt work actually allows your mind a chance to breathe. Yeah. And yeah. after doing that yeah. grunt work, you could be thinking and plotting your next move. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but when you're not used to doing that for somebody else and just making, you know, uh, hours for dollars, those wages, yeah. Yeah. it's really hard to it's hard. come to that, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, yeah exactly. The, th that whole thing for me, it wasn't, it wasn't a shame thing. So you got to do what you got to do. And whether it's, you know, I was selling stuff and it, it, that was always my mindset. Let's just figure out what, what I have to do to, to move forward. And, I give a lot of credit to, to people that, you know, are like, okay, I'm going to go do this. You know, I'm going to go work at Amazon. I'm going to go slug the hours out and pay the bills because that, that is the priority, taking care of yourself. Uh, it's a lot better alternative than just sitting around uh, and wasting away because you have to stay mentally engaged and you have to stay physically engaged um, or you're just going to wither or die, you know, on the vine. That's right. And now the other part, the reason why I said it's sad is because there are so many uh, crew people, tech people, and musicians who come off the road and they literally think that's, that they are relegated right. to that to eternity. Right. Um, right. But, you know, hopefully by listening to things like this, they get ideas and, 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 and the motivation starts kicking in, right? Yeah, you know, it's interesting to me uh, to that whole thing is, of course, people say, well, would you have envisioned this a year? Well, hell no. None of us would have envisioned any of this. I, I can't believe as I sit here and talk about the business that I own now that we're, you know, that I'm working on Christmas pre-orders for cinnamon rolls, you know, and we're rounding over 25,000 cinnamon rolls in, in nine months. Like, I would never, never have thought that. Uh, but what's interesting is that when I sit down and look at it, um, the only reason that we've been able to be successful uh, on the logistics side is it's still logistics, right? It's still what I do for a living. I, I deal with logistics and systems and processes. So where most people, home folks would have gotten stumbled and failed because they don't know how to take their recipe from six cinnamon rolls, which is the... I mean, that was the first time I ever made cinnamon rolls was in April. Never done it. This wasn't my recipe, family recipe. I came up with a concept. I built it, made them, and then we adapted it. But I was able to take that and go from six to 600. And that's where a lot of home cooks would have failed. But it's the same skills I use, the same you know types of processes, scheduling, leadership, all of those things. And so it's really not that far away at the end of the day. Uh, and you said the L word, logistics. I love that. Yes. It's true. The, the other cool thing is not only are we providing for ourselves, there's 11 other people, touring people that I'm hiring that are helping us. And they're all roadies. Everyone's a roadie that's come out to help us. And the, we work in a cloud share kitchen, right? And so we pay per hour to use a part of the facility. And there's about 50 other makers that work there. There's other bakers. There's all sorts of different companies, catering companies, hot sauce companies, whatever. And so it's run by this lady named Laura. She owns the facility and she has seen hundreds. I mean, when you come in there, you're just a cog. They just look at you side eye. Well, let's see how long these people last. And when we came in, they're like, oh, cute. Here's some people that are making cinnamon rolls for fun. And then by the third or fourth week, when they see us rolling hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rolls out, everybody's like, what are you guys doing over there? Like you start to be leg you know, legitified. Uh, is that a word? Legitified? Legitimized, word. I believe. Legitimized. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's a word now? Damn it. Uh, you heard it here first. Um, I don't think mine is a word either. So. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we were getting out the door and we had a weekend where we had sold uh, one day, we had something like 1,200 rolls. And 
I lined it up and everybody there was a roadie and was helping me out. And, and I came up with a system and we put them on the counters and we did this. And one person was coming down and putting the buttercream. Another person came behind and put this on the next person, this next person closed it. Then they slid it down to the end. And this lady, Laura was just watching us. And she's like, that was incredible. She's like, I see what makes you good at your job. I've never seen anybody come in here and direct a crew and knock something out of that scale in that amount of time. That was absolutely beautiful. And I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. It's just, this is what we do already for a living. Like this is, it's, That's yeah, it. it's cinnamon rolls, but it's, it could be loading lights in or set you know, tuning guitars or whatever. You come up with a process and a system and you repeat it. It's, it's, it's leadership. You just said it. It's management, it's direction, it's leadership. Yeah. It's, it's logistics, putting it all together. You know, it's like the foreman on a job site. Mm-hmm. So it's beautiful. And actually, here's the reality of it. Again, we're very strong type A personality type right. people. If we did go work at Target or Home Depot, it would only take several weeks or a month or two before we'd move up into a management position. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, like, it's like, come on, we're just, we, we, we're not capable of, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think part of it is I know for me I'm not capable of just listening to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew that about you. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when I know no, I can facilitate this so much better or so much more expeditiously, right? And I think that's the point. <laughs> yeah, and that's what as I've talked to people that have gone and done these other jobs, it's the same thing they say. It's so hard to be in this. A lot of people are comfortable being in the role of just falling in as a cog and and taking direction and just clock in, clock out. But we're not wired that way is touring folks. And so that's the struggle coming in and being there and seeing how other people operate and wanting to be more efficient, wanting to take charge. And And I've thought, you know, coming out of this one thing that's been blaringly obvious to me is there's a need of somebody in the industry to bridge the gap between touring what we do uh, our skill set and the corporate world, because I think a lot of corporations would be would be uh, benefit greatly from having roadies come in and and people that are used to operating this lifestyle get it done, work hard, hustle, that's you know. Right. And but there's such a difference in terminology and structure that that's the gap that needs to get bridged. I mean, I wouldn't even know where to start looking on LinkedIn. So there there is a there is something there down the road that I think this has become blaringly obvious needs to be addressed. I think I think perhaps in the pop-up space as the pop-up market begins to grow, you know, that could because like you said, in our industry everything has to happen now. There's no time as the words are flying out of your mouth, people should be start to they should start right. moving, picking right. things up and putting them in their place, right? You know. Yeah. It's it, 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 you know, expediency is like the the, the key. Right. Yeah, and what company wouldn't want that? It, it, what Amazon, Target, Home Depot wouldn't want those types of people working for them. It's just connect, connecting it in the way that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell us, okay, now that we got that covered, tell us how the bug bit you. Like, when did you say, oh my gosh, you know, I saw this band, I saw this tour, and I decided I have to do this for a living, you know? Oh man. 23, I mean, from the very first time I saw shows. And of course, at the time I started in the industry, I didn't know half of the things existed that exist now. I mean, actually, some of them didn't. There were positions that are on tour that are considered essential now didn't exist. exist. There weren't playback guys. There weren't (laughs) touring (laughs) engineers like that in in automation guys and all these advanced level positions just didn't exist 20 years ago. But I knew I had the bug and I was playing in a band and probably had a you know, interesting, different reality from you is, is I went to, you know, I went to school for music and I was playing and it played a little bit of everything. And, but here is the funny part. So I, I played guitar, I played bass, I played sax, I played piano, I played all these things. And I remember being at, uh, at the school and they had rehearsal rooms, right? You could book the rehearsal room and you little small little practice rooms. And so I remember walking down this hall and the first room I could hear some guy playing some jazz guitar. And where I, where I live in Chicago, that was kind of the, that's what you would get hired to do as a guy. If you're a live guy, go play these jazz things. And so I was like, man, that guy's pretty good. And he's better than me. And like the next room was a, a, a guy playing sax. And I was like, wow, that's like fucking Kenny G in there. And you know, why the next one? And, and it literally had this moment where it's like, I know I'm good and I know I can hone the skill. And all these guys are actually kind of better than me. So let me take my unique skill set and do something different with it. And I made a pivot at that point to, you know, 
I didn't care what I was doing. I just wanted to be a part of music. I wanted to be traveling. And that actually benefited to me as I grew as a sound engineer to be able to have that background as a musician so I could actually have conversations with, with musicians, not that like atypical uh sound guy, techie guy, you know, that's talking, but can't, but you know, you're, you're, I mean, you're, you're rare because you are technical, but most guys in your position don't want to hear about, you know, the, the fucking mic, you know, gain structure and compression <laughs> settings. You're like, I, I just want to play music, man. Like, like get off my back. Like I want to play music. So when you can approach somebody and have a con like, yeah. you don't want to have a conversation with a sound guy, you know, preaching at you about it being too loud. Right. Like, that, that wears you down. But when you have a guy that can come articulate to you like, Hey, this is what you're doing. I know what you're trying to achieve. Maybe there's a better way to achieve it. Let's try this. Or like, you know, what, what you're playing on this guitar isn't translating the way I think you think it is. You're standing in front of you can't hear how, how it's translating because of this or that. Uh, but I think it will, you know, fit better if you maybe try this approach. And so it's actually been super beneficial for me to have that background to sort of bridge that gap between the techie guy and the, and the musician guy. Absolutely. So if I look at you and the music director, I'm like, Hey, do you want us to keep running that chorus? You're like, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's a great idea. Run the chorus so I can get the full dynamic effect of that yeah. song, which yeah. will enable me to mix it. Right. Yeah. And versus you're like, no, no, don't step on the chorus pedal. No, not the chorus pedal. <laughs> 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 yeah, but no, absolutely. Having, having shared, having, you know, a, a good handle on shared terminology within the business mm -hmm. from department to department is vital. I think, especially yeah when it comes to positions like production manager, front of house, and music director communicating, which that's, that was our roles together. Um, let's say this, like you said, 80-20, it seems like 80% of our jobs is solving problems. <laughs> you know? And then the other 20% is just like, oh, I can now just do my job, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's the shortest. Well, if you think about it in the reality of it, what what's the show, 90 minutes to two hours? Right. And you spend the entire day yeah. just doing everything else other you know everything else goes into it so that's kind of an interesting way to look at this show is the smallest part of what we do that's right that's right and you know something else too that i think uh you touched on it briefly is the communication skills are the communication skills the proper leadership skills the the psychology the sociology that's involved with leading a team of people because um, this leads me to our next question. Let's face it, getting a tour on the ground to actually, obviously there's lots of advancing work you have to do. But yeah. after the advancing is done, to get the tour on the ground and to launch it takes massive amounts of planning and you know strategizing. But if you don't have those proper communication skills and leadership skills, as soon as it launches, you're going to fall flat on your face, right? Yeah, 100%. Well, it's... it's uh a couple of things I always tell people managing production is, you know, they say, well, your job is so hard, so complicated. Like, well, actually managing production is easy, really easy. Managing people is hard. Right. You know, same thing for you as a musical director, you, you can, we inherit and probably even more so for you. I inherit, I know the type of people that go on tour that are going to do these things and be away from their family and work the long hours and be in the shitty venues and eat crappy catering and all that stuff. They're the fringe, right? They're kind of the rough around the edges. I always used to tell, I tell this story, my father, he had inherited it from my grandfather. He had this saw, it was a skill saw, like a circular saw. And this thing was heavy. It was 40 pounds. It was hard to manage. It was way too big. And you know, I remember the first time I went to use it, it was a disaster, right? I, I couldn't cut anything straight. It was just, and he would insist that I use this saw. And the entire time I worked with him whenever he would do construction stuff for my entire show, 20 years. He always used a saw that was older than me. And I, I'm like, dad, you can buy a new saw. Why are you using this saw? This is ridiculous. It's heavy. And he's like, this saw has served me well for 30 years. And in the right hands, this tool will do anything you ask it to do. It will cut through anything. It will never fail you. And I learned a lesson about, you know, I'm not saying my crew are tools, but learning to manage these, these wheeled, you know, unwieldy, hard to, you know, as soon as you can learn that, you can get anything you want done with them. As soon as you can learn to lead people with strong personalities that may be hard to, to handle, 
you'll get anything done. And, and, and for you as a, as a musical director, you deal with all sorts of people as musicians, all sorts of folks that are eccentric, you know, that are thrown off kilter by the, 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 the smallest thing, you know, and you have to learn to manage it. The, 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 those types of personalities, that type of thing. And that's what makes you successful learning. Uh, you know, that's what made, has made Ricky Minor successful. Like you can take these strong personalities. There's lots of talented people, but you, to put them in a space to get them to do a cohesive musical thing, managing all of that, that's where the real skill lies to pull all those things out, the best qualities from everyone. And that's what I, I think you've done really well working with those people, you know. This is Zito, production manager for Green Day, Ariana Grande, CO1 Republic, and many others. You're listening to The Career Musician with Nomad. Be sure to subscribe to The Career Musician podcast and like The Career Musician on all social platforms to stay up to date on news and topics that affect your music career. Want to learn more about a particular topic? Tag at the Career Musician and use hashtag Career Musician to let us know what you'd like to hear. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank thank you for easy. saying so. Yeah, thank you for saying so. Uh, I think two things come into play. First of all, I love the fact how you disguise the word uh, diva with eccentric. Because <laughs> 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 we're all divas. Musicians are all fucking divas. No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and But the other thing is, I think it takes a huge, huge, huge amount of self-awareness. And, you know, you and I, uh, uh, we've been, we have done this for a while, quite some time, many years together. And it took that self-awareness for me to humble myself and come to you and say, you know what, Zito, I, I'm sorry about last night. I was wrong. You were right, blah, 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 and, and vice versa. Absolutely. And for us to, to maintain that friendship and that bond and be able to have those conf- uh, conversations and that transparency. If you don't have that transparency and the willing to say, you know what? I was wrong, guys. I'm so sorry. I said, take it from letter A. I actually meant take it from letter C. Here we go in five, four, three, two, one, kick it off. That's obviously a small example, but right. much larger examples. Um, yeah, I just think that those are the key ingredients. And, and it doesn't have to be this. I love the way you put it. Like this awareness, we all fuck up. We all make mistakes. We're, but but the goal's the same, so we don't need to beat it into the ground. Yeah, you know, guys, that was that one was on me. Because the thing is, as a leader, some not all, sometimes all the time you make the wrong decision, but you still have to make decisions and move it forward. You can't be. That's what we do as leaders, right? And everybody, when they're with you long enough, learn that you're not infallible. That you're going to make mistakes. Uh, you're going to make the wrong decision. But sometimes you just have to make a decision. And so you are in this thing of constantly moving it forward, making decisions all the time and adapting to those repercussions, the decision, good, bad, or otherwise. And, and I think your people around you see that like, oh yeah, we just have to, we can't sit around and talk all day how we're going to play a song. Like, all right, guys, we're just, let's take it here. Let's start moving this forward. Okay, no, that's not working. Let's try this. You just... You know what I mean? You got to do my, that. You gotta, that's my favorite. To this day, I have a, a small team running production for the, for what we're doing here with the career musician. We're, we're building much more than just the podcast. But you know, the, when when I feel like we're swaying and we're getting off course, hey everybody, listen, uh, let's let's focus. I'm so sorry I have to do this, but I have to pull focus right now. All right. So I'm pulling the reins in. What's our key? You know, focus point at this moment. Let's let everything else fall aside. Mm-hmm. And, and and that is one of the things. Also. You can't make everybody happy. Yeah. Uh, however, the person or persons whom you need to be concerned about making happy are the people who are employing you directly. Right. So, you know, and uh, so we're, we're of course, going to make the artist happy first. Yeah. Right? yeah. Then management and, and then down the line. Uh, I can't be concerned if the bass player is pissed off. You right. know, because of the decision I made. Hey, as long as the artist is happy, then sorry, bass player. Is there a bass player that isn't pissed off? I mean, <laughs> kind of <thing. laughs> I got shorted two strings and they're not a drummer, so they're just angry. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm I, love it. I love it. We have all these. Oh, come on. Yeah, yeah. I, I, we're not even going to get into about the guitar player syndromes. We're not even going to get into that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is good stuff. Okay, so let's, you know, this is a good segue. You said that you started, you entered the DJ world with Steve Aoki. First of all, what a huge fucking name to go into a new, a new territory. That was amazing. Well, 
was it was funny. My my literal mindset going into this, uh, and anybody that's worked in this world would find this funny, but I was naive. I thought, okay, I'm working for these big pop acts, and and there's so much that goes into it, and there's all this, you know, there's wardrobe and dancers and all this stuff, and I thought, man, it's it's a lot, right? So. Maybe it'll be maybe I just want to work for a DJ. It's just a guy that comes up there and plays a couple turntables, and they've got these big shows. Oh man, it's a whole different world of stuff, right? It's it's you know stores like with Steve. Every DJ's got their for their gimmick, their gag, whatever it is, right. and it becomes the thing. So yeah, I wasn't dealing with dancers and wardrobe. We were dealing with cakes and and all this other craziness, you know, ball pits that he was jumping into and all these things and playing these venues. And you're just like, okay, it's just, it's the same thing. It's a different thing. Although you only have one person to, to make happy. It's not a band. It's not a group. It was a different thing. And he was, he was a cool guy. I got along with him well and, and wish that we had done more than three or four shows before the, the tour got hands canceled, but you know, maybe down the road. I really loved his uh, documentary on Netflix. I enjoyed yeah. watching that. And, and basically, the one of the common threads throughout the documentary is that he was just grinding, grinding, grinding nonstop yeah. to the point where he was getting worn down. Did you experience that with him where he was going so much? It was incredible. Well, yeah, he didn't take... I mean, when I looked, when I first got the routing, uh, it was three months every day. And I was like, how are we doing this? And he, we would literally, the tour, the movie, so we had a touring production, right? Like you carried everything with us and did all these shows, but we would have a day off and he would be in Vegas that day. And this guy was flying. I mean, we'd be East coast and he'd fly there. And there was not a single day that he actually took off and he would fly on the jet and he'd fly to Vegas. He'd fly to Mexico. He'd fly to wherever. I mean, I think on, on new year's Eve, he did three shows and he worked with the time zones and he did three shows on new year's Eve. Wow. <laughs> and, and the other thing with the DJ world is that the set times are insane. I remember looking at some of these going, wait, this has to be a typo. What do you mean we're starting at 1230? Like, PM? Oh. Like, <laughs> no, no, we're loading out as the sun's coming up. And so that was definitely took a little bit of, of getting used to that and the like nine opening act DJs that, uh, you know, oh, we're starting music at 4 p.m. and the headliner goes on at 11.30 or 1 or 2 in the morning and it's like, oh, okay, this is this is something else, yeah. Uh, how did you figure out time to actually get rest in a, in a scenario like that? Because you yeah, you it it in, you're the first in. Yeah, yeah, you take it when you can get it. Uh, I've mastered what I call the, the chair nap. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little 30-minute power nap where I just, you know, that's it. You take it when you can get it in short little bursts. And everybody knows you're grinding it out. I've always said, like, you got to take care of yourself, but you just have to be accessible. You know, I don't mind if somebody needs to go crash, you know, for a couple hours in the afternoon, as long as I know where I can get you, there's a problem. And that's kind of how it is. That's right. That's right. So now let's talk conversely on some of the big tours, One Republic or Backstreet Boys, who, or whom, uh, there's so many. Um, what was the the biggest tour you've done with the largest amount of production and trucks? So for, you know, uh, yeah, Ar Ariana last year with Ariana. Yeah, we core uh, ABC party, hundred and thirty people. Um, I think we were twenty trucks and sixteen buses, uh, something like that. Yeah, incredible. Okay, so uh, for the listeners who might not know, when you say ABC party, can you explain what that means? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the small when you. When you get to larger tours, we start to separate out groups, right? You, we don't travel or operate as one entity. So in the case of the ABC party scenario, the C would be the crew. And I'm responsible for the crew's production manager. So we had approximately 100 people uh, on the crew party, plus then the 20 truck drivers and 15 bus drivers that sort of fall under our, our, our realm as the... As the um, C party. The B party is typically referred to as the band party. So in this case with Ariana, it would be the leaders for that group, the road manager for the band. The dancers fell in there too. So it was the band plus all of the you know, 12 dancers or 14 dancers, whatever we had out there. And then the A party is the artist party. And so that would be the tour manager, security, and then everybody that, you know, the bigger the artist the more a party there are that could be hair that could be makeup and we had a tanning person out with us a nail person out with us a hair person uh all that falls on the yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> the glam team right yeah yeah oh yeah exactly the glam team uh with some rap artists the a parties are huge the you know the posse right it's one artist and like 30 people traveling with them the hype people that 
I don't know, stand on the stage and yee, oh, whatever. You know, like I don't get, I don't, I don't get that world, but you know, that's part of it. That's part of the thing. These huge traveling groups. Wow. Incredible. Okay. So as you're advancing a show, as we call it in the biz, give a little bit of insight there. And obviously you have a production assistant, production manager assistant. Do you have yeah. more than one assistant on those large tours? How does yeah. that work? Yeah. So there, um, the only way to operate with a group that big is by department. So we have our the production department, that'd be myself, production coordinator, which handles like the traveling logistics for, you know, because we're a big group. So all the flights, the hotels, the movements of it, uh, visas and that sort of stuff. And the production assistant is kind of handling a lot of the day-to-day needs for the, the crew, laundry and food needs and that sort of thing. The riggers and and stage managers sort of fall under production. And then we have uh, crew chiefs. Every department has a crew chief. And so we try to really streamline it. So I'm not leading a group of 100 people. I'm leading a group of 12 people each of the departments. So the audio department, the backline department, the video, pyro, all those things, carpenters and that sort of thing. And so that way I... I lead them and they lead their teams and disperse the information that way because it's just not feasible to be able to work with a with a big uh, group directly like that. So try right. to be accessible, but that's sort of the best way for it to, uh, to work. And like you mentioned earlier, that's a parallel to the corporate world. You have departments, right. department heads, you know, yep. overall leadership, general leadership. Okay, so let's say this. Post-COVID, po- COVID starts cleaning up. We're coming back into a, a live performance world. Yep. I'm a young crew tech person. I want to get immersed in the business. I want to work for somebody like yourself. I want to work for Zito. I want to work on the biggest world tours. How do I get there? What do I do? What's my first steps? Uh, first steps, you got to make put yourself into the situation. You, you've got to be willing to work. You've got to uh, build the relationships, do whatever it take uh, takes. There's going to be a lot of opportunities for the young guys coming in uh, to work multiple positions, to you know, work with the local vendors. If you want to be a sound guy, work with the local sound companies. It's always interesting to me. You know, I worked my way through the business, starting up uh, working for small bands, playing clubs, working my way up all the way to Redax. It was it was the hard path. I got to be honest with you. It wasn't the easy path over twenty years to do that. Some of these kids that that go work for Claire Brothers Audio. I was like, what was your first tour? They're like, oh, you too, Beyonce. I'm like, okay, yeah, okay, cool, right. My first tour, I slept on the floor in a van when we drove overnight from club to club. Like literally, that's in no hotel rooms and here they are on the A-level tours as like the ninth or 10th audio guy. So it's kind of funny to me that that exists, but that's, you know, that's how a lot of people will get their starts. But you developed real true grit with all yeah. that experience. And that's yeah. what I think is, man, you can't put a value on that. That's, that's. Well, and an appreciation. I mean, when you've done that and you've busted your ass and you've loaded in the clubs and you slept the gear versus your first tour. I mean, they're bitching because the catering sucks here. It's like, Oh man. Yeah. But you're in a posh hotel on a, in a nice bus with the best accommodations, right? Yeah. Catering's not awesome. Take, well, whatever, like you, shut up, move or, on. Right? Go down the street to uh, any other restaurants in the area. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or you could, yeah, you could be sleeping, eating in clubs and, and doing that whole thing for years right. and years. Right. So when you're out on the road and the shit hits the fan, do you have a mantra? Do you have some kind of self, you know, decompression button? <laughs> uh, well, you can't see you can't see that this tattoo. Actually, I think you can look at it either. Well, yeah, I I W I I. It is what it is, right? And not in a way to 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 uh, shirk responsibility and not take accountability for your thing, but in the way that okay, this is the situation. Adapt, you know, overcome. You can't change what the situation is, and that was you know we did a year with One Republic where we did the craziest touring you've ever seen all around the world here there overnight you know shows in russia next day in vegas and and like the craziest things and the guys would be like this is insane i'm like yeah this is insane but it is what it is there's no point in sitting around bitching complaining right we're just gonna move forward right like okay we can't change the schedule we can't change the venues we can't change the circumstances we only change our attitude and mindset so it was very much a mantra and i paid for the whole tour to get tattoos because it was nice. what everybody would say like all right it is what it is we're not going to change it so let's let's change how we look look at the situation 
You know, that reminds me, I always say, I always tell management because uh, both in your position and, and the music director position, we are the liaison between the artist, the band and management, right? Uh, and I always say, we have to keep spirits high. We have to keep team morale up. And that reminds me of you getting the, the tattoos for everybody. That's one way. That's great. I remember another time when we were in Japan and you and I were like, yeah, let's, let's take the band and crew for sushi. You oh, know? Yeah. And when, we, when you do stuff like that and you're bonding and then we paid for it, you yeah. know, so that nobody had to come out of their pocket yeah. to pay for it, that builds such a, a, a connection, right? A camaraderie. Yeah. Well, and, and I always say it, there's a lot of guys in my position. This is a big one for me. There's a lot of guys, senior guys, because the position I do, most of the people are older than me. Uh, and, you know, I know they've put in their time and their dues, but they'll, they'll come in a little later and they'll leave a little earlier. And I've always said, if my guys are in the building, I'm in the building. If they're there on the day before doing a pre-rig, I'm in the building. If the, I'm there till the last truck gets loaded out, and people see that I'm, I'm might not be there necessarily, you know, loading the ring out or loading the truck, but I'm still there. I'm still part of it. The same thing for you when the guys see you still woodshedding, right? Putting in the time, working on the tunes, a day off, like, uh, Hey, you want to grab a coffee? Well, I'm trying to work out this arrangement. I'll, I'll catch you when I'm done with it or whatever. Like when they see you leading by example, that goes, you know, a long ways. And the same thing, you know, treating the crew and the amount of times I've bought stuff for the crew or paid for everybody's drinks at a bar or something right. you know, it's not in a showy way it's like a, hey i appreciate you this is something i can do and and i'm gonna do it for you absolutely so true cool. man getting close to wrapping this up because i know you're a super busy man sorry I, i'm with you i my headphones not for you. yeah yeah no i know you're super busy so we're gonna wrap this up here how do you define success oh that's a great question uh, well, there's the obvious of being able to, to, to support yourself. I think that's that's a, a huge thing. Uh, as professionals, I, I never will say I've made it or I've arrived at where I want to be on any level. To me, success really boils down to, to doing what you love to do, always working at honing your craft and improving. And because I don't, there's no, I think the most successful people wouldn't, it may be admit that they're successful. People look at me and wow, look at all these things. Well, yeah, cool. But I have so much more I want to do so much more. I want to learn so much further. I want to go. I will never stand at the top of a mountain and say I've arrived. It's always, well, I, this is, part, this is where I'm at in the journey. Man, that is so key. I, I say it all the time. Uh, you know, even my wife will say, well, you know what? Stand back and just revel in this win that you just had this achievement. Yeah. Like, nah, <laughs> I don't have time to do that. I got to think about the next <laughs> move. You know? Yeah, yeah. But we do have to do that. Like, I, I, because it's really hard for guys like us that are so motivated to, to constantly move forward, to, to let those wins sink in, to pat ourselves on the back and, and take a moment to, to do that. So we, I think it's a good reminder to do that. But that's it. It's a moment. All right, cool. Onward and, and, uh, and upward. I thought, there was something in, in the Clive Davis documentary I thought that was kind of the same same th sort of thing. Even when he had the mo time, I mean, the, yeah, it's just crazy what all that he's achieved. And then there was never that moment I've arrived. It's like, okay, what's the next artist? What's the next thing? Where, where right. is it going? Right. Speaking of which, what's your future look like? Because now, uh, self, you know, self, admittedly, you you put yourself into two giant, uh, you know arenas <laughs> pardon the pun well you know workspaces now you have this food business you still yeah. have touring you're you're not giving up touring because you were telling me okay. you were on the on the line with a huge client coming up soon yeah yeah so i'm excited to so 2020 uh i've taken on the role as production manager for green day so that's the next thing that that uh, is in the horizon whenever that whatever that goes so i'm working right now getting that thing geared up towards touring in 2021 and a reschedule of their dates and all that sort of thing so we're hopeful that that happens and and when the, the tour goes out like it's supposed to so we're working towards that as far as uh, rock and rolls nashville and the, and the and the bakery goes same thing we we've built it into this thing and so we're going to regroup look at how we want to move it forward. We're not going to walk away from it. We want to, this to be a brand, whether 
we're directly making the rules or not. So that's something we're doing over the next couple of months, figuring out how to transition into it, bring some other people in that can run the business and keep it moving forward, stay true to our cause with supporting music cares and other people in the entertainment industry. Uh, so there's a lot of future for that too, whether or not I'm the guy. I mean, it'll be weird for me. I've hand rolled 25,000 cinnamon rolls you know, in nine months. It'll be weird for me not to be the one doing that. But uh, there is a future of the bakery with me in a different, you know, different role. It's, you know, more of my face and less my hands. <laughs> it sounds like a potential franchise is on the horizon. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely possible. That's beautiful, man. All right. Hey, do you have real quick time for some rapid fire questions? Okay, let's do it. All right. Name three tour essentials. Um, passport, passport, laptop, cash. <laughs> I like it. Song, band, or artist that changed your life? Pink Floyd. As an entertainer, it's hard to be entertained sometimes. What does it for you? Oh, man. Uh, musicianship. Oh, I like that. Passion, yeah. I like that. Uh, name a couple artists on your playlist, current playlist. Uh, Fleet Foxes. Um, I've been listening on old school. Uh, Fleetwood Mac, Old Elton John, uh, Old Floyd. Yeah. What do you do on those long travel days, either on a bus or a plane, to keep from going insane? Well, two different things because I get super motion sickness on, on buses. So that's unfortunate. I can't, it's rough for me. So I fly. Um, read. I love to read. I read, read, read. My Kindle is that actually travel essential Kindle. Best investment I ever made. I can't read on my phone. Glossy screens, they all suck. I always have books and I read 99% fiction books because it allows me to escape um, and not be focused on improving myself and another skill and learning this and that. It's that on a plane is the time where I can go in another world uh, that's total fantasy and it gives my mind a break. I love that. What are you currently reading? Actually, I don't read at home and that's why I miss traveling so much. I'm so busy to run this bakery. People would be shocked at the amount of time and effort. I don't have a spare moment. I work from when I get up at six o'clock in the morning or well, four o'clock on the bake days until I go to bed at 10 or 11 o'clock. So there is no time to to do that. So I'm, I need to get on tour to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. that is one of the common uh, concepts in, in the biz, right? Uh, especially now. So, yeah. all right. What are one of your guilty pleasures? Uh, wow. I love whiskey. I love bourbon. Uh, yeah. I have a huge, huge uh, here. I know nobody's going to see that, but a whole collection of single uh, and, and bourbon sitting over there. So, yeah. Man, I just recently got introduced to the Balvini and Monkey oh, Shoulder. Monkey Shoulder. I have a ton of McAllen right now. I have McAllen's all the way, two rare casks, and then I have a 12, 15, 18, 30. And then my 40th birthday, I got the coolest gift I've ever gotten. You can't – It's a bur- it was a bourbon that was distilled in, in 1978, which is when I was born. So it's technically a 37-year-old b- bourbon because of the bottling process. You can't actually get it that but it was it was distilled in 1978 so 37 year old uh, single malt scotch so I, that will be a special occasion that's amazing finally bro what would you do if you weren't a career musician <laughs> uh I, I can't i hate to say it i can't see myself doing anything else this is in my blood maybe a travel blogger but it, i would still be hanging out at venues <laughs> taking buses and airplanes and and uh, yeah or perhaps being a baker. <laughs> or perhaps be right. Who would have thought? Awesome. And by the way, not too long ago, you were on the Kelly Clarkson show. You, yep. said you had a feature on Forbes. So you've been doing yep. some great press with the company as well. Yeah, we all sorts of things. Um, we, but, you know, as we started it, that stuff doesn't come. You know, people look at what we do and they get maybe a little bit jealous of the success. Uh, but you create your own circumstance. You got to work for it. You got to hustle. You got to bust your butt. That stuff, everybody asked me, oh, how'd you get on Kelly? Well, we, we did what we had to do. We emailed, we called, we texted, we told other people, we did other shows. You know, it was one thing. We did the little show that led to the other show that led to the Kelly show. They actually found us through another show that we had done that was a small, you know, small little interview thing and we're perusing for other stuff and that's how it happened. So everybody has the same resources where it's a level playing field, you know, uh, you can create your own destiny. 
I love that, bro. We started with that. We're ending with that. Perfect bookends, you know. Thank you so much, my brother, for being a guest. Yeah, super awesome. I, I love this so much. Help us continue to provide you with new and engaging content by getting our ratings up. Please subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you've enjoyed today's interview, please subscribe to the Career Musician Podcast and leave a review. I'm just a nomad, nowhere man Writing the songs in this one-man band A nomad This is Nomad, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast, and I am thoroughly stoked to be an official member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Pantheon Podcast Network is the first of its kind as an all-music-based podcast collective. Please be sure to check us out at pantheonpodcast.com for more info.